Hello, welcome to Lab 9, Biology 139. We're going to be talking about the urinary system, and we're going to talk about a couple of hormones, two of them, and we'll look at the structure of the kidney, how the kidney makes urine. We'll talk a little bit about di three types of diabetes. Most people know about two types of diabetes, but they don't know about the third type that we're going to go over today. And then when you pee in a cup, what happens when they take it away through that little magic window and send you results back? You're going to be able to do that yourself. We're also going to look at the specific gravity or how thick your urine is. So we'll look at that too. So that's some of the stuff that we're going to cover today. You are expected to go out and research in your book and online what the answers to these questions are. So I'm going to give you some applications because I'm assuming that you did your homework and you already know what the definition of these words are. Last semester we talked about isotonic solutions, hypertonic solutions, and hypotonic solutions. And we talked about how it affects red blood cells. So here are some pictures of normal red blood cells just going along, and if you put them in a hypotonic solution, the fluid, the water, will go through the semi-permeable membrane of the cell, and it will rush in and fill up the cell. So the red blood cells will plump up, and if you have enough of a hypotonic solution, and you continue to leave the red blood cells in it, they'll actually burst, they'll lice, and spill their contents out. I tell my students the cautionary tale of some parents who were ignorant. They weren't necessarily stupid, but they didn't know anything about hypertonic, hypotonic, and when their son acted out, they were going to purify him and cleanse him of his evil ways and they made him drink glass after glass after glass of water and they diluted the child's blood by forcing him to drink so much water that his red blood cells popped and he died so they actually killed him just by making him drink water so it's important to understand what hypertonic and hypotonic is and here's another cautionary tale for you. If you go in the hospital and they hook you up to an IV and they just run water into your bloodstream, they're going to dilute the fluid, the plasma, that is outside of your red blood cells. And so they're going to kill you very quickly just by running water into your IV. So every time you get an IV, they have to put something in it that is about the same osmolarity as what's inside your cells. So let's take a second to try and understand the concept of osmolarity. You know from studying your cells that inside the cells you have the nucleus, you have endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, you have all the food that you're bringing into the cell, hormones that you're bringing in, you're making proteins. You have all those organelles that are made of fats. So you have all kinds of different things I'll call stuff inside your cell. And they don't usually come out of the cell. They're usually trapped inside behind the cell membrane. Now outside you have plasma. And so the red blood cells and the white blood cells are floating along in the, in the plasma. And as long as the plasma has about the same amount of stuff as inside the cell, then we say you're in an isotonic state, and that's what you want to be. You have the same amount of solute outside as you do inside. The solute doesn't have to be the same. Obviously, you're not going to have endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and ribosomes out in your plasma. Those are trapped inside of cells. So what you're going to see on the outside of the cells, you're going to see sodium and potassium, uh, chloride ions, magnesium, 
proteins, albumin, all kinds of things. So what you need to think of is just the amount of stuff on either side. And now, if you can remember one rule, then you won't have any trouble with osmosis and which way water is going to move through a semi-permeable membrane. You need to remember that water always goes in the hypertonic direction because it's trying to dilute it so you have the same amount of stuff on the inside as the outside. So in the case of the uh, boy whose parents made him drink water, you ended up with less stuff in the plasma because you were diluting it continuously with glass after glass of water. And the boy couldn't pee it out fast enough to prevent himself from uh, his blood plasma becoming hypotonic. Hypo. Not as much stuff. So the water rushed into the cells. The cells plumped up and then they ended up uh, popping. So you ended up with the child dying because he couldn't carry oxygen. As well as clogging up his kidneys with broken red blood cells and stuff like that. In another scenario, let's say you're out running a marathon and you're sweating, so you're losing fluids through your skin and you don't stop to take time to drink some more fluid to replace that that you're losing. So you're going to make your plasma, the stuff outside your cells, more concentrated. So now your plasma is going to be hypertonic and you're going to start sucking the blood, the uh, uh, plasma, excuse me, the water out of the cells and diluting the plasma. So in this case, the red blood cells are going to wrinkle up or crenate. So here's some pictures of real red blood cells that have been put into a hypertonic solution and so it sucks the fluid out of the cells through the semi-permeable membrane. So here is one picture right here and here's another one right there. And you're looking, you're going, well, what, what makes it look like that? Well, inside of a cell they don't have a skeleton but they do have proteins that hold the shape of the cell. So the proteins are still there trying to hold the shape of the cell. But because you're sucking the water out, it's kind of like a, a circus tent. When the, uh, when the canvas stop, starts sagging. So that's the cell membrane draped across those support proteins inside there. So we call that crenation. So you're going to be expected to go back and review osmosis, hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic, and know which way the water will go. So it just makes common sense. The water is going to go towards the most stuff, so it will dilute it, so then you're isotonic. That's what you want to be in your body. Now, if you're making an IV, you can put in normal saline. You can put enough salt to what we know is normal saline, 0.9%. Uh, and you could put glucose, which the rest of the world calls dextrose. That's another thing that you could add. If the person has uh, missing electrolytes because they've been sick for a while, then you may want to add some sodium, potassium, magnesium, other electrolytes in there. So you can make your IV isotonic with different things. You just have to have the same amount of osmolarity in the IV bag as inside your patient. Now I want to stop for just a minute and talk about a solution. So a solution is, is something that will dissolve something and then something that is dissolved. So you can make Kool-Aid and you get a glass of water and you put a pack of Kool-Aid in. So the water is going to be the solvent because it's the thing that's going to dissolve the uh, powder and then the sol solute is going to be the actual sugar and the Kool-Aid powder. 
that you're putting in and stirring. And you're going to make a solution that we call Kool-Aid and we drink it. If you're trying to dissolve oil and water, they don't mix. So you can't make a solution of oil and water because they don't mix. But you could um, use alcohol or you could use another oil. You could dissolve one oil in another oil. And sometimes when you're looking at jewelry, you have a solution of gold. So you don't make jewelry out of pure gold because it's too soft. It'd be like trying to make it out of aluminum foil. So what they do is they mix it with other metals. And then they tell you how much gold is dissolved in the other metal. And they talk about 10 karat gold, 18 karat gold, 24 karat gold. They're telling you how much of the solution of metal dissolved in metal is gold and how much is something else. When we do the endocrine system, we're going to talk about various hormones. But in this particular chapter or lab, we're going to talk about antidiuretic hormone or ADH for short. So most people know what a diuretic is. A diuretic is something that makes you pee. And one of the most common diuretics that I can think of is caffeine. So you drink some caffeine and pretty soon you got to go to the bathroom and pee because it causes you to put more uh, fluid in your, uh, your bladder. So you, you get that urge to pee. So we're going to learn about how that works. So this is one of the concepts that students seem to get messed up on because this is not diuretic hormone. This is anti-diuretic hormone. So it prevents you from making urine. It stops you from peeing too much. Anti-diuretic hormone. And one of the interesting things, you know, sometimes you have a kid who's a bedwetter, they can't wake up in the night to pee. So they end up wetting the bed because they don't know. And they think it's because they're not making ADH yet. And so, you know, spanking them, embarrassing them, doing anything like that isn't going to help. You're going to have to wait until they make enough antidiuretic hormone that they can sleep through the night without having to pee. So that's one of the things that they caution parents not to blame your child for bedwetting because, you know, uh, if they don't have the hormone, they can't, they can't stop the pee. So they want you to look up where does the ADH work within the kidney tubules? What effect does it have on osmolarity? So we remember we talked about osmolarity when we were doing osmosis and hypertonic and hypotonic. And then what effect does it have on urine volume? We well, should be able to figure that out if you remember that it's anti-diuretic. It is not the diuretic hormone. I'm sure all of you guys have learned about diabetes, and they talk about type 1 diabetes, and they talk about type 2 diabetes. In the case of type 1 diabetes, you stop making insulin. And so for the rest of your life, you're going to have to have insulin injections. So insulin takes the sugar out of your plasma. It takes it out of your bloodstream, and it stores it in the liver, the muscles, but it has to somehow be able to go using a receptor into a cell to get out of the bloodstream. If you do not have diabetes, when we look at your urine, we should find no sugar in it because your body will find something to do with all the sugar. It's too precious to waste by your peeing it out. In type 2 diabetes, you can have a couple of different problems. One of them is you're not making enough insulin. And a lot of times this happens for people who are really, really overweight. They're grossly overweight. So they literally just can't make enough insulin to keep up with their needs. The other thing that is another cause for it are people who can't make the receptors on the cells that are able to take in the sugar. So the sugar goes by, the insulin is there, but there's not a receptor to tell the insulin 
to, to bring the sugar on into the cells. So you can have a receptor problem or you can have not enough insulin. So those are the two types of diabetes that you're used to hearing about. But there's a third type of diabetes, and it really doesn't have so much to do with insulin or with sugar. It is diabetes insipidus. And it's usually a problem with your antidiuretic hormone. So in the case of diabetes insipidus, you, you just keep peeing because you don't have the anti diuretic hormone. So you lose too much fluid. A second hormone that you're supposed to look up and know the function of is aldosterone. So hopefully last semester you learned that cholesterol is not a horrible, horrible thing. It's a precursor molecule and cholesterol makes estrogen, testosterone, and it makes aldosterone. So this is going to be acting on the kidneys as well as other places in the body to regulate your sodium and your potassium. So you need to look and see how it does it. What happens if you have too much aldosterone? What happens if you don't have enough? And where exactly in the kidneys does it work? Now I'm going to show you where it's made because this is one of the things that you need to learn when we're learning the structures of the different organs of the uh, urinary tract. So here's your kidney right here. And in this particular picture, it kind of looks like it's wearing a little red hat. So when I'm talking about it and when we're doing dissections and things, I, it looks like somebody is taking their chewing gum and, and taking it and just parked it on top of the kidneys. So this little thing that's sitting on top of the kidneys, but separate from the kidneys, is called your adrenal glands. And so everybody knows about adrenaline and adrenaline rushes. So that's another thing that's made here, as well as aldosterone. So make sure you look at antidiuretic hormone, and make sure you look at aldosterone and see how that affects urine production. Check and see what it does with specific gravity, with uh, plasma osmolarity, and do these things interact with each other? Will it increase your urine volume? You'll eat, eat pee more or pee less. So spend some time thinking this through. If you drink the right amount of water, the recommended amount of water, what happens if you're dehydrated? You're too sick to get out of bed and go get any water. Or you've got diarrhea and as fast as you can drink it, it comes out the other end. So you can't stay hydrated, so you get dehydrated. And then what happens if you drink too much? This is a nice table. So when you pee in a cup, they have a little uh, dipstick. You can get a can of dipsticks that look like this and you take one of them out here you are right there the dipstick and here are the different tests now this happens to have tests for six or excuse me ten different things you can get them that'll test more things you can get them that just test sugar that's the only thing they test for so this particular one you're going to look at oops sorry about that uh, if you have any white blood cells, so you pee in a cup, you dip this little stick down in it, and then you look and see. If it stays this color, then you don't have white blood cells in your urine. And that's a good thing because you shouldn't have white blood cells in your urine. Your urine should be basically sterile because you filter it out in the kidneys. So there shouldn't be any bacteria, there shouldn't be any white blood cells. So if you do see white blood cells, then you can assume that either you have damaged the kidney somehow or you have a bacterial infection or a yeast infection. Something is causing the white blood cells to migrate into the uh, urinary system to try and wipe out some sort of bacterial infection. So if it goes all the way over into the purple, then you probably need 
to have some sort of a treatment, figure out what's going on. Now, there are certain bacteria that you can get in your um, urinary system, and they make nitrites. So this would be specific to a kind of bacteria that make nitrites. So usually you would have both of those purple. The first row and the second row would be purple. Then when you are breaking down your blood, you have different colored components of the blood. Most of the blood you recycle. You take the iron and you put it back into the um, new, newly formed red blood cells into the new hemoglobin. But some of the parts of the uh, red blood cell breakdown, you do pass out in your urine. So there's a certain amount it's okay to have and a certain amount it is not. If you have proteins, usually this is not a good thing to have proteins in your urine. The range of pH of urine can range all the way from down around 4 on up to around 8. So it's not like blood. Blood has to be within a very narrow pH range. But your urine, this is stuff that you're getting out of your body. So it's not as important what the pH is. And we're going to see in a minute from this table what would cause you to have a low pH urine and what would cause you to have a high pH urine. Now you definitely do not want to have blood in your urine because remember the the uh, urine should be sterile and you're going to filter out the blood and send it back in the body it's not going to go into the kidneys and then pass into the urine so if there is blood in your urine it's because something has damaged part of the kidneys to allow bleeding to occur so that's something you want to find out usually it's some sort of a bacterial infection but sometimes it's because you played uh, tackle football and somebody hit you in the kidneys and so you, you you're going to bleed from your kidneys for a while until that heals up then there's a specific gravity so they have uh, said that water just pure water with nothing in it is one and then if you add stuff to it remember the osmolarity and the so you add stuff to it, and then you have a specific gravity that is thicker than water. It's, there's stuff in it. And think of it as going like towards syrup. You know, syrup is very thick and sticky, and water is, is not sticky at all. So your urine will be down closer to the concentration of water than it would be to the concentration of syrup. If you got really thick, Thick specific gravity, high specific gravity, because you had too much stuff coming out in your urine, then this is a, a danger sign because you're just asking for kidney stones to develop inside your kidneys. And then we come to ketones. And this is the one that just kind of freaks me out because usually you, this is what you test for in diabetics to see if they're making these ketones. So somebody had this brilliant idea, why don't we mimic that? Why don't we take all of the carbs out of our diet that we can and induce our bodies into to making these ketones? So normally, if you see this, you go, oh my gosh, this person is in crisis. They have ketones and we need to fix their diabetes because there's this this is bad and it can kill them. And these people are artificially causing their body to, to go into this state of having too many ketones in order to lose weight. And I'm thinking, you just need to eat less. <laughs> you just need to get a grip and don't kill yourself by... So I, haven't, I don't know how many people have died from the ketone diet, but it is not a healthy one. And I certainly do not recommend it by any means. And here's another blood breakdown product right here, the bilirubin. And then here's the good old glucose. You should have a nice blue square there. 
if you are peeing out sugar, it's going to go all the way over here to this uh, brownish purple color. And that is not okay. So you're, you're definitely diabetic and you're in trouble if you're all the way over at this level. So this is nice because it says, well, what, what happens if you do have proteins, proteinuria? Well, non-pathological, meaning it's just something you're doing to yourself, would be pregnancy. So you can have protein coming out in your urine because you're pregnant, or if you're just eating a lot of uh, meat. So, you know, you start out with bacon and eggs for breakfast, and you have a hamburger for lunch and a steak for supper, then you're probably going to have some protein coming out in your urine because your body just can't handle that much protein. So it'll just come out in the urine. But pathological, meaning, uh-oh, you need to go see a doctor and have this treated, would be if something has damaged part of the kidney, the glomerular membrane, for example. And one of the things that can cause this is hypertension. So if the blood that's coming to the kidneys to be filtered where you get rid of the waste, you pee out the waste, and you keep the good stuff and put it back in the body. If you have hypertension, it can come, it can cause the blood to enter the kidney with such force that it actually tears the membranes in there. So hypertension can cause strokes, but it can also destroy your kidneys. So you, you don't want to mess around with hypertension. You want to find out what's causing it and take your medicine correctly. All right. So the biggest thing that, that's a danger in your body that you have to get rid of, but you normally make a lot of it, is nitrogen-containing compounds, urea. So we even talk about urine. We need to regulate the amount of nitrogen-containing compounds in our body. Most people... I always tell my students this, they, they don't die from whatever it is, the illness that they have. They die because their kidneys stop working. So a lot of the people who have cancer, they don't die of cancer. They die because their kidneys shut down. But they'll put cancer on the death certificate because that's what did them in. Pneumonia, a lot of times is because their kidneys stop working. So unless you're killed like in a car wreck where you just get killed instantly, a lot of us will die from kidney failure due to whatever illness that we have or whatever uh, situation that our body is in. So, urea, if you eat a lot of protein, you're going to have an elevated urea. But usually, if you see a lot of urea in the urine, then it's because your kidneys aren't working correctly. So that's a, a nice signal to let you know that you're, in, you're getting in trouble with your kidneys before they actually fail. It is possible to binge eat sugar. You eat so incredibly much that some of it comes out in your urine, but your body is extremely efficient in taking the sugar out. So you rarely have a non-pathological reason to have sugar. But if you have diabetes, one or two, not three, one or two, then you're going to have glucose coming out in your urine. Heart attack, so you don't have proper uh, blood circulation or impaired blood circulation and brain injury are a couple of other things that can cause you to have uh, glucose coming out in your urine. All right, ketones. If you have a low carb diet, that would be non-pathological. That's something you did to yourself, but if you have a pathological cause, it would be starvation or you're in diabetic acidosis. So this is a danger signal right there. All right. Again, you don't want blood in your urine. Sometimes when girls are in their period and they pee in the cup, they get a little blood contamination. So uh, if you do, if they do find blood in your urine, they'll ask you to come back when you're not in your period or else they'll send you back in the bathroom and have you clean yourself off before you pee in the cup so that you don't get any blood accidentally into the, to the urine. So that would be non-pathological. That would just be a, a normal thing that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. But what could be wrong is if you have some renal disease 
or a, an infection in your urinary tract, or if you have kidney stones. So kidney stones form in the tubules inside the kidneys, and they are pointed, they're sharp, and they can actually damage the tubules, so they start bleeding. So you'll see the blood coming out. So you should never have blood in your urine. White blood cells shouldn't have white blood cells in your urine either. So it could be, again, from women, because our urethra is flush with our body, it doesn't come out to the end of the penis and then where you can pee out, you know, away from your body. And so we could get vaginal discharge in there. And you do have white blood cells in your vagina that they're helping you, you know, fight the bacteria and the yeast and the things that normally make up the the inside of your vagina. If you have them as a pathological reason, it could be because you have a kidney infection or you have an inflammation. Itis means inflammation, like appendicitis, tonsillitis. How about that one? Glomerulonephritis. So you have some infection in your kidney. Hopefully you guys will go on and take medical microbiology, or med micro as they call it, and you'll find out about the bacteria that can get in the urinary tract and release nitrites. And if you get urobilinogen, you normally have some of this because we do recycle our blood. And in fact, if you notice, your urine is usually a yellowish color. And so that, a lot of it is the pigments from uh, broken down blood. But if you have a little bit, you have a little bit more than that, it could be because you have hemolytic anemia. So there's all kinds of anemias that you should have learned when we did the blood system. But this is one that causes the red blood cells to break open, hemolytic. So they're, they're breaking open and they're releasing the hemoglobin into the bloodstream. And then if you have liver disease, so usually this one, when they see this, they're going to go start doing urine tests, or excuse me, liver tests, to see why you're releasing that into your urine. All right. This one, bilirubin, again, is a breakdown product of the blood. And again, we'd be looking at liver problems. Or an obstructed bile duct. So in last week, we studied about how the liver makes bile it stores it in the gallbladder, and then it goes down to the pancreas to be released. If you block this ability, then you're going to end up with uh, bilirubin building up and then spilling out into your urine. All right, here's your normal range. If you are a vegan or a vegetarian, so you don't eat meat, your urine is going to tend to be alkaline. But if you eat a lot of protein, then your pH is going to be acidic. So this is normal. It's just what you eat can affect your pH. But here are some abnormal things. So if there's something wrong with your metabolism, then you can get alkalosis. You have too much alkaline uh, substances in your blood and in your urine. So that's, that's not okay. And then diabetic ketoacidosis or starvation is another thing. So again, why somebody would think that that was a good diet? Hey, let's, let's act like we're going to be diabetics that are dying Ooh. or people who are starving to death. That'll work. All right, and then there's specific gravity. And here's the range. And notice it's not very much. So let me stop here for a second. And I'm going to show you a refractometer. And you see, they're not very expensive. If you want to do this at home, you can do this at home. This has a little clear door that lifts up. So here's a picture of it lifting up over here. And you put a drop of urine to cover this blue area. And then you lower the lid back down. So if you were just to put pure water in there and lower the lid back down, it would read 1 on this scale. You can look through this and see what the, what the reading is on this scale. But if you put solutes 
into the fluid, which is what your kidneys do. They put stuff into your urine so that you can pee it out. It's going to cause this lid not to sit down all the way. So it's going to stick up a little bit, and then you're going to get this reading. It's going to be a little higher. And the more stuff that you have in your urine, the higher this little door is going to lift up where it won't lay down flat, and the higher this is going to go. So this is going to tell you how much uh, stuff is coming out. It'll give you the osmolarity of your urine by looking at this. These next experiments you can do at home. This is kind of a fun thing to do with a classmate or to do with a family member. But look and see how much you urinate. It says record the time that you peed, that you emptied your bladder, and look right down the stuff that you ate. So was it salty? Did it have caffeine in it? Because remember, caffeine is a diuretic. And salty foods are going to cause you not to pee. You're going to retain fluids if you eat salty, flu uh, salty things. So you're going to pee in a cup, and you're going to see what volume it is. And then you're going to drink just water so it doesn't have anything in it. So you're going to be diluting your, your body. You're going to be diluting your plasma. And so you should dilute your urine also. So see how much you pee if you drink uh, a liter of water. So everybody knows what a two liter Coke looks like or a two liter, you know, pop. So this would be half of that amount. It'd be one liter. And then another group of you eat potato chips, which are salty, or tomato juice, which is acidic. So this is another thing. It has a lot of stuff in it, too. So if you've ever drunk tomato juice, it's really thick. So it says drink at least three glasses of tomato juice or two plates of potato chips. Mm, I want to be in that group. Always when you're doing an experiment, you need a control group. So you're going to have somebody who does not eat or drink anything. And then they're all going to go pee and see who pees the most. So you should be able to guess what's going to happen from that. And then the other thing is do a urinalysis. So when, you, when the people who ate the potato chips pee, what would you expect to be in their urine? What do they need to get rid of? So that's what you would look for uh, at, as an elevated rate in their urine. All right. So when you go to the doctor, they have you pee in a cup, and they do the chem strip on you, and they do the specific gravity. They check and see how much solute you have in your urine, how thick it is, basically. And they can also look at the chloride content, how much uh, this particular element that you have. You usually have sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium all kinds of different electrolytes hang out with chloride, but sodium and potassium are the biggies. And you just take a half a milliliter of urine, you add some potassium chromate to it, and then you add silver nitrate, and you see how many drops it takes before you get a red precipitate that falls out of solution. And that'll tell you how much uh, chlorine you have. So there's a chlorine test. This is a nice table because it tells you what's normal. It is not normal to have blood. It is not normal to have bilirubin in your urine. It is not normal to have urobilinogen in your blood, or excuse me, your urine, uh, ketone bodies, unless you're on one of those crazy diets, glucose, albumin, protein should not be in there. You shouldn't have nitrates, and you shouldn't have white blood cells. So... It's kind of easy to look at this and go, okay, you shouldn't have any of those things in your urine. And then your pH should not be below 4 or 4.5, and it sh certainly should not be above 8. 
If you pee every 30 minutes throughout the two-hour lab, you can start out with the first urination right here. How much did you pee? What was the specific gravity? How much chlorine was in it? And then you can figure out what your urine flow rate is. You can calculate that because you're going to do this excuse me, every 30 minutes. So you want to fill out this table every 30 minutes. You want to do the control and figure out what they are at time zero, 30 minutes, one hour, hour and a half, two hours. And then you want to do the same table with someone who had this sugar, excuse me, the salt, they ate the potato chips, the person who had the tomato juice, the person who drank distilled water. This is an electron micrograph picture of part of the kidney. This is the part that's going to be making the urine. So you bring in blood through arterioles and they dump into this wad of capillaries. And we call these little wads of capillaries glomeruli. So these are glomeruli. Whoops, right there. So there's a larger arteriole coming in we call the afferent arteriole and then there's a smaller one coming out so the importance of that is here comes blood it's going to come in it's going to enter this wad of capillaries but because the exit is smaller then it can't come out as fast so what's going to happen is there you're going to push the plasma out now this one is, t they've taken the outer covering off of these so that you can see the wad of, of capillaries. But there is something called Bowman's capsule. Kind of looks like a catcher's mitt. And as the plasma is squeezed out of these specialized capillaries, it's caught by the Bowman's capsule. And then it starts being processed to take the the waste and send them on and return the good stuff back to the body. So you'll learn more about that in lecture. But we, we want you to be able to identify this on a microscope slide. So this is what it looks like if you take a slice of your kidney. Here's that wad of capillaries. Here's one there, here's one, here's one, here's one. So those are your glomeruli. And then this kind of what looks like a clear space around it is called Bowman's capsule. And it's the one that's going to catch the plasma as it is squeezed out of the capillaries. So they can be processed and make urine. So you need to know that the Bowman's capsule plus the, the um, glomerulus is known as the renal corpuscle renal corpuscle. So it's both those things together. Then coming off of that, you're going to have tubules. So we're going to look at the tubules in just a second. So here it is on one slide. So these little things right here are tubes that are carrying the plasma that's being processed into urine. And then if you go down deeper in the kidneys, then this is what the tubules look like. And you don't have any more of these renal corpuscles, which are the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus inside of it. So you don't have those. You're just looking at the, the tubes themselves. So you know that this is deeper down inside the kidney. There's basically four main parts of the urinary system. You've got the kidneys, and then you have the tube that comes out of each of the two kidneys. And those are ureters. And they go down to the bladder. And then coming out of the bladder, you have the urethra. So that's basically the parts. And then you have the adrenals, which sit on top of the kidneys. Now these are pig kidneys, and they've taken the adrenals off. So you don't get to see those in this particular picture. But they cut it open so you can see inside. So here's the inside. So here's where the urine is going to come out, and it's going to go down to the bladder. But first of all, it's got to be processed. So you need to know that this outer layer 
right here. Here you can see the outer layer. And here you can see when they've cut it open, you can see the outer layer. That's called the cortex. That is the renal cortex. And I remember it as like cork. And you have cork on the outside of a tree. And then the rest of this stuff is the medulla. It's the middle part. And each one has a different function to making urine. So that's why they talk about the cortex and the medulla. And when they talk about the adrenal gland, it also has a cortex and a medulla. So here are the things that we need to look at and know on these particular um, kidneys. So last time when we talked about the lungs, we did the respiratory system, there is only one way in and out of the lungs, and that's the hilum. So that's where the, the nerves come in and the blood comes in and out. So instead of it being all over the lungs, there's just one major area called the hilum. And this is the hilum of the kidneys. So you don't see a lot of stuff coming in anywhere else. Look how smooth that is. So it, it enters and exits here. It's a little bit hard to see in here, but these are little pyramid-shaped things right here. Here's a pyramid-shaped thing. Here's a pyramid-shaped thing that's in the medulla, and we call those the renal pyramids. How about that? And here's the renal pelvis. So all this urine that's going to be made here is going to end up in this pelvis. It's a little bit easier to identify things on this model than it was on the pig because they've made pretty colors and you can see it very, very clearly. So here's the cortex right here, the outer part. And here's the medulla here. There's your pyramids right there. And uh, the tip of the pyramid, they said, kind of look like a nipple. So they call those papilla. So there's your papilla right there. And these are in your medulla. They're in your medulla. Here's your renal pelvis. And here's your ureter. So you're going to be coming down and, and coming into the bladder down here. And your, your kidneys sit in a pocket of fat. And one of the things that happens sometimes to people who lose weight drastically, really, really fast, is they dissolve away the fat pocket that their kidneys are sitting in, and their kidneys drop. That's called ptosis, but it's spelled P-T-O-S-I-S. -S. So it looks like it should be ptosis, but it's just ptosis. And you can get a crink in the ureter, and so you stop passing urine through. So sometimes people with normal kidneys and they're having normal kidney function and all of a sudden, you know, they go in with those crash diets and they lose so much weight and then all of a sudden they're having trouble with their urine. And so they need to, to, to do a, a scan and see where the kidneys are because they need to be held up so that this can drain out right there. So a sudden, like overnight... Uh, decrease in kidney function or you know within a week or two is often due to a, a ptosis or dropped kidney. Now you really can't tell very well from this picture the difference between the left and right kidney is that the left kidney is larger the left kidney is larger and it's also higher than the right kidney. So if you were to look at this picture, it's easy to tell. This is the left one over here because it's higher and it's larger than this one over here. Left is larger, left is higher. This is apparently a female because our tube coming out of our bladder, our urethra, is flush with our body, whereas a man's will go all the way to the end of the penis. So they have a longer urethra than a woman does. So I'm not seeing any extended urethra, so I'm assuming female. There's your adrenals right there sitting on top. There's your cortex, which is thin outer layer. And this one is kind of a, a brownish color. 
or yellowish color. And then there you see the pyramids. In this particular picture, they're white instead of the nice red ones over here. Your renal pelvis. Remember the convention that everybody agreed on is if you're looking at an artery, then you're going to make it red. And if you're looking at a vein, you're going to make it blue. So this is the abdominal aorta. So the aorta comes out of the heart and it arcs over in the aortic arch. And then it comes down through the abdomen. And it's going to drop off the blood, some of the blood on the way, to be filtered by the kidneys. Now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. So here are models that are showing you a nephron. So a nephron is the combination of the renal capsule, which has the Bowman's capsule, excuse me, the renal corpuscle, which has Bowman's capsule and then the glomerulus inside there. And this thing is called the proximal convoluted tubule. So proximal means close to. So that's coming out of it, so it's proximal. And it comes down and it goes into what we call the loop of Henley. So some dude named Henley named it after himself. And then you come back up and then you have the distal convoluted tubule. And then you have the collecting duct right here. So it's going to collect the processed urine and send it on down to the um, renal pelvis. Now, here's a close-up picture of just the Bowman's capsule right there in the glomerulus inside of there. And you can see the afferent coming in and the efferent leaving. And one is much larger than the other. The afferent comes in and the efferent exits. So this is all you have to know for this week's lab. But you really should take a minute, and I'm going to take a minute now, to tell you exactly how a nephron works. Because if you know how it works, then you're going to remember the parts better. So remember, this is just a quick overview so that you'll remember the different parts. If you want to go down uh, into more specifics, be sure and watch the lecture portion. But this is just for lab. So you've got the afferent arteriole bringing blood into this glomerulus, this wad of capillaries. And here's the Bowman's capsule right here that's going to catch the plasma that is pushed out of the capillaries. And then the rest of the blood, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and the rest of the plasma is going to leave by the efferent arteriole. All right, now we're in Bowman's capsule, and we're talking about osmolality. We're talking about the stuff. So they, they do it by milliosmoles, and around here it's about 300 milliosmoles. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule right here. And this one is where you're going to start really absorbing the stuff you want to keep in your body. Now on the outside of this, there are blood vessels. And so as the stuff is transported out, it goes into the blood vessels and is returned to the body. But they've stripped away the blood vessels, so you're just looking at the tubules and seeing what's going on with them. So here we are, we're taking the good stuff out, keeping it, the sugars and the uh, minerals and things like that that we want to keep. But the um, recreational drugs that you may have tried, hopefully not, or medicinal things that you've been given by the doctor to take, um, things like uh, uh, smoking marijuana, you know, it's going to come out in your urine, you know that. So they do urine tests for that. So that's going to stay in these tubules. Now, as you descend out of the cortex and you go down, down, down into those pyramids of the medulla, 
you're going to have more stuff outside. And so what's going to happen because of osmosis is the water is going to go where there's more stuff. So out there in that medulla, there's more stuff, a lot of urea and some other salts and things. So you're literally going to suck the water out of this tubule. And it gets thinner as you go down. So it slows it down. And by the time you get to the bottom of the loop of Henley, your osmolality is all the way up to about 1,200. So you start out about 300. So you're concentrating the stuff that remains behind, the stuff that you don't want, the stuff you're going to get rid of. You concentrate it and you concentrate it. And this is one of the reasons is you should really make sure that you drink the proper amount of water because you can see if you concentrate this and concentrate it too much, it could precipitate out. You could end up actually precipitating out. And then you're setting yourself up for making kidney stones. So you want to make sure that you drink plenty of water every day. Stay hydrated. And it doesn't have to be drinking water. You can eat fruits that have juices in them. All right, now, as you come back up, so we went all the way down to about 1,200, and now we're going to come back up, and as you go back up, it's going to put the water back in, and it's going to take some of the salt out. So you're going up, you're going up. So look at that. We started out at 300. We went all the way down to 1,200, and now we're going to come up, and we're going to be around 100 milliosmoles. And then we're going to go over into the collecting. So this is the distal convoluted tubule. And I am going to take a few more things out right here. And then if you remember studying, this is where your aldosterone is going to act right here. And it's going to decide whether or not you keep the sodium and you keep the potassium. So make sure you look and see what the function of aldosterone is on the distal tubule. And then it's going to come into this collecting duct. And the collecting duct is going to go down, down through the, the medulla. And it's going to come to the renal pelvis. And by the time it gets down there, oops, that's not right. That was surprising to find that, uh, can you believe it? Somebody posted something on the web that was wrong. So, anyway, we were going down the loop of Henley. We were getting to 1,200 milliosmoles. We came back up. We were pulling out the salts. We're keeping those and some urea and stuff. And then we come on up here, and we're at 100. And now when we go into the collecting duct, we start descending, and you start pulling the water out again. And so you end up concentrating the urine. So it's very, very concentrated. So one of the questions students always ask me is, you know, if we're on a, a boat and we're dying, can we drink our own urine? Well, you can, but it's going to be so concentrated with salt that it'll be like eating a bag of potato chips. So it'll actually hurt you because it's so concentrated. Remember, it started out with just the plasma being around 300 and then by the time you're coming down here and dumping it into the renal pelvis and dropping it on down into the, to the ureter, to the bladder, it is extremely concentrated with salts. And remember, one of the main things that we want to do is get rid of nitrogen compounds because otherwise you'll have ammonia build up in your blood and it'll kill you. So anyway, so there's the collecting duct coming down and concentrating your urine.